Good morning, everybody. I hope you are all doing well and ready for a fun program this morning. My name is Kevin, I'm talking to you here from the Fenimore Art Museum in Cooperstown. And before I do anything else, I always just like to make sure when we do one of these Zoom programs that you can see and hear me okay. So if somebody wants to give me a thumbs up or, or make some kind of um, notification that you can hear me just fine. I see some thumbs up already, so that is great news. Okay, cool. So thank you so much. This is gonna be a very exciting morning because we have a very special guest here today. Um, Mark Brown is a number one New York Times best-selling author, winner of three Emmy Awards, the George Foster Peabody Award and the Television Critics Award. Next year, Mark celebrates two anniversaries, 25 years of Arthur on PBS and 45 years of children around the world reading Arthur books. The exhibition that we have at the museum right now is called Believe in Yourself, What We Learned from Arthur and is sponsored in part by Nellie and Robert Gibson, WCNY and WMHT. We are very excited this morning to have Mark Brown with us. And what I would ask before we um, send it over to Mark, is um, please make sure that you keep your microphones off. Um, we also recommend keeping your webcams off just to make sure that everybody can be see Mark and his presentation before we see anybody else. And at the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions through the chat function in Zoom. And we would very much like it for any children in particular who have any questions for Mark to pose their questions in the chat first. So without any further ado, I am going to send it off to our special guest today, Mr. Mark Brown. Good morning. It's really good to be with all of you. Um, I wish you were here in the auditorium with us, but uh, this is the next best thing. I guess what I'm hoping that we can do together this morning is I want to share with you uh, what I love to do, and that's write stories and illustrate them. And I'm hoping, and I really think I know that you guys probably like to write stories or make up stories too. So maybe you'll get some ideas. I'm hoping to share how I do what I do, and uh, maybe that will inspire you to make some stories of your own. Okay, let's get started here. I'm going to share my screen and go to, uh, okay, there we go. Ah, there's Whoopi with Arthur. I think that uh, I, I really love seeing the way people react to Arthur, uh, what connects them with these characters. and. Pretty soon, uh, I'm gonna tell you exactly where these characters came from. Well, there's Arthur, and he loves to read, and you know his last name is Reed. That wasn't by accident. So I've got some questions here. Um, and if we were together, I would invite one of you to come up on stage with me and ask the questions. But this morning, I will be the question asker. Okay, what was I like as a kid? Uh, I was a little kid uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, planning my escape. Um, and I like to make up stories. Uh, I like to play. Um, I was meeting a lot of very important people. And here are some of my friends. Uh, apparently, I was packing heat then, back then, in kindergarten. Do I like my job? I love my job. And you know why? I got fired from a lot of other jobs. I was a short order cook for a while and that didn't work out too well. I was uh, a truck driver. I was delivering things, but I kept getting lost. I lost that job. And this was um, one of my other jobs. I worked as an art director at a television station. But here's how I lost this job. I think it was so unfair. Uh, there's Shirley in the green suit. She was the weather woman, and they wanted me to do something to make the weather show more interesting. So my idea was to dress Shirley up as a weather fairy. And 
the show would open where Shirley would swing into the set on a swing and then she would jump off the swing and tiptoe over to a wishing well and say something like, well, what's happening today with our weather? And then I would be in the well and I would talk to Shirley and I would say things like, it's snowing today, Shirley. You better get out your earmuffs. That's when my boss started looking at me very strangely. And the next morning in my mailbox, there was a little pink slip of paper and I was fired. But the good news is I found the best job in the world. And I work for you guys. You are my boss. And every morning when I go out to my studio and go to work, I think about you and trying to make up fun stories and hope that you will like them. What got, got me started writing these books? Well, when I was in high school, I had a new baby sister and all she did was cry and poop. And I couldn't stop the pooping, but I could stop the crying. And you know what did that? I was able to read her books and her favorite book was Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. And I know probably most of you have read this book, but when I was reading it to my little sister, Kim, I was struck at how Maurice Sendak told this story with so few words, and he used his pictures to tell a lot of the story. And that taught me a lesson that I will never forget. And I think of it every time I'm working on a new book. The words are on one side, the pictures are on the other side. And what can the words do that the pictures can't do? And what can the pictures do that the words can't do? And I tried to take away words or take away parts of the pictures so that I'm using just the barest amount of both and telling the story in the strongest and cleanest possible way. Did you like to read when you were a kid? I did like to read. I was a pretty good reader, but we didn't have a lot of money for books at our house, but we did have something really wonderful. Not too far away, my grandmother, Grandma Thora, that's where I got the idea for Arthur's grandma, Thora. And my great grandmother would tell me and my three sisters stories whenever we wanted them. We loved hearing about my great grandmother coming to America on a ship with her 13 brothers and sisters. And she was down in the bottom of the ship where it was very dark. And one day the ship got stuck in an iceberg coming to America and there was a bad storm and the ship was rocking back and forth and she was trying to cut bread for her little brothers and sisters and the knife went through the bread and cut her hand open. And then she would show us where the scar was from the knife entering her hand. Her stories were filled with really great details like that. And that's another thing that left an impression on me when I write a story and Grandma Thora would tell us great spooky stories about witches and she would take out her false teeth to tell those stories and that made it really spooky. We loved those stories. And here I am with my dad and two of my sisters. My, my dad didn't read to us too much but he did something really wonderful. Uh, occasionally on Saturdays he would take me to the Erie Public Library and the children's room was downstairs and we would go right by the children's room and we would go upstairs where you see that window over the balcony there. And that was a section of the library devoted to American architecture, early American architecture. And he loved old houses. And he would take out these books and he would show me the fences and the windows and the doors and the details. And you know, what I learned was when an adult does that for a kid, no matter what it is, if you're really passionate and excited about something and you share that with a child, it makes an indelible impression on them. And it sure did for me. I've restored eight old houses now. Yes, we have two pets. 
Lola and Romeo, and they are brother and sister cat team. We got them at the rescue uh, animal place on Martha's Vineyard, and we've had them now for 15 years, and they are really great pets. So where do I work? Where do I make all of these books and work on TV? Uh, most of the time, I'm in Martha's Vineyard working upstairs over the garage. It used to be an old sheep barn. The house itself is pretty old. It was built in 1730. But I took over the upstairs of the garage and inside, if you came in while I was working, you'd see me standing up at that table. I built the table, it's pretty big, it's four feet wide by eight feet long. And I really like standing up while I work. And um, usually I'll get to work early in the morning. And sometimes if I'm working on a book that I really, really love, I forget to eat lunch. My hobbies, oh yeah, I do have hobbies. I think my favorite hobby is growing things. Uh, I like to grow raspberries, apples, blueberries, pears, peaches. And then, now there's my raspberry patch. It looks good there because I've just finished weeding it and pruning it. I like to make pies. I started making pies when I was 12 years old. I was picking uh, peaches in a neighbor's yard and I brought them home and I asked my mom to make a peach pie. And she handed me a cookbook. And she said, turn to page 256 of Betty Crocker and she will tell you how to bake that pie. So uh, I did, I followed the directions and I baked my first pie, peach pie. And I fed it to my family that night and everybody loved it. And so that got me started. It gave me confidence and I've been baking pies ever since. Okay, so when I start a book, after I get the story written, that for me, that is the hardest part. I don't think of myself as an author, uh, but I think of myself more as an illustrator. Um, so here's the book, Arthur's Tooth. After I wrote that first story, I had to plan how many pages I had to work with because the publisher will tell you, you have 32 pages and you have to tell your story within that framework. So then I have to break up the story in different parts and figure out what picture really works best with those words. And this is when I, I plan the book out like this. The first book that I wrote was Arthur's Nose. And this happened when I didn't know what was going to happen what, what, within my life, what, what my job would be, because I was teaching at a small college in Boston and the college closed. And I went home that night and I was really depressed. And my son Tolan, who was, uh, I guess about five at the time, he said, Dad, will you tell me a bedtime story? And I said, I'm depressed tonight. He said, oh, come on, Dad. Maybe it will make you feel better. And he was right. It did make me feel better. Uh, but I wasn't sure what to tell him the story about. So I said, OK, Tolan, what should the story be about? He said, um, how about a weird animal? And so I started thinking alphabetically. And I landed on Aardvark and I thought, that is an underrepresented animal in the pantheon of children's literature. So this story will be about an Aardvark. And then I said, what would his name be? And I thought, well, another A word, Arthur. So we had our character and our name and the story started. And, you know, looking back now, I see Arthur was unhappy with his nose. He had a problem and I had a problem too because I didn't have a job. And this turned out to be my new job. Why did Arthur's nose change? I think that is the question kids ask me the most. And you know, I've been drawing Arthur now for more than 40 years. And at first, in that first book, you could see he looked more like a real aardvark. But over time, he kind of changed. His nose got shorter and shorter and shorter. He started to look more human-like. And it was, I wasn't doing it on purpose. I just, that's the way Arthur evolved in my mind. He was more human-like. 
and his nose got really small. You know, sometimes I wonder, do you think Michael Jackson read my books as a child? I don't know, just something I thought about the other day. Do I have a family? Yes, I do. Would you like to meet them? Okay, here's a lot of them in one place at one time. This was, there's my, <clears throat> my mom, Renita, in, in, almost in the middle. My youngest granddaughter, Isabella, in the middle. My wife, Lori, in the white shirt and skirt. Um, Tolan and Tucker and Eli are in the background and my, anyway, there, a lot of us are there, some of my sisters. And my wife, Lori, is, um, I work on some books with her. She's really good at writing books about difficult topics that help families, like when someone dies in your family. We've been doing books about dinosaurs dealing with these problems, dinosaurs divorce, when a dinosaur dies. Uh, recently, we wrote a book about being a good citizen in our country. You know, that's a really important thing to learn about when you're young. And uh, that's called Democracy for Dinosaurs. You might want to check that out at the library. And, Arth and Lori's also a great artist. If you come here to the Fenimore Museum and visit my show, Right next to my gallery is Lori's gallery, and she has some of her beautiful work there. She works a lot in paper and found objects and materials. I think you would, you would like it. It's very playful. Where do you get the ideas for your characters? Okay, let's get started on this. This is a secret. Okay, this is, oh, back in third grade. Let's go back here. I'm the nerdy kid in the second row with the bow tie. This is Miss Kingston's class in Lakewood Elementary School in Erie, Pennsylvania. And all around me in the front row, um, that boy with the light colored shirt and the ink stains on him, uh, that's my friend, Terry Johnson. He turned into Buster. Um, right behind him is Alan. He turned into the brain. Next to him is Patty Del Porto, who turned into Sue Ellen. I had a kind of a crush on her. And then up in the back row in the flowered dress is Suzanne Lang, and she turned into Prunella. And over on the right side, that tall kid turned into Binky Barnes. Doesn't he look like a teacher? I wondered how many years he was in third grade. I don't know, but he was really miserable at recess and used to pick on us. And then way over on the top row on the left-hand side is our teacher, Miss Kingston. And she used to make us popcorn in class. And she got married that year and invited the whole class to her wedding. What was she thinking? And in seventh grade, I had a teacher I'll never forget, my algebra teacher, Mr. Rathbun. I turned him into Arthur's teacher, Mr. Ratburn. My sister, Bonnie, was really good at sports. She was very bossy, liked to talk a lot. She turned into, guess who? Francine. But I didn't just have one sister. I had three. And I kind of combined all three of them to make a character who was triple trouble. Now, who could that be? You are right, DW. I heard you say DW. And Arthur, I confess, I'm a lot like Arthur, and uh, that's probably where it came from. I was surprised at how easily I could remember everything that was going on in third grade and, and have Arthur go through a lot of those experiences. So I get the ideas for my stories from real life. For me, I think the best things happen in real life. Uh, like Tolan, when he was in kindergarten, he was worried about going to day camp. And out of that experience happened, Arthur goes to camp. Tucker in second grade had a loose tooth that just wouldn't come out no matter how hard he wiggled it. And everybody else in second grade had lost a tooth. And I thought, that's a good story. Maybe that could make a book. And it did. And Eliza, when she was learning to ride her bike, she did not want training wheels. 
and she lobbied to get those training wheels off. And when she did, uh, things didn't work out exactly as she had planned. And a book happened from that, DW Rides Again. So why did I make Arthur into a TV show? Because it was something I never planned on doing. But PBS came to me and they said, we would like to use Arthur to make kids want to read and make cartoons and put them on television because those are two really important things that kids like, cartoons and television. So why not use it for ways that are helpful? And uh, I also had a lot of help <clears throat> from my good friend, Fred Rogers. He, uh, I admired what he did on television and how helpful he was and how he used television to be helpful to kids and families. He would explain things and take time. And I thought I could do that with Arthur, make funny stories, but also be helpful about something that kids were worried about at the same time. And you know, our, uh, Fred Rogers was one of our first guest stars on Arthur. And there he is, swinging with Arthur. And that was a story, remember Arthur was embarrassed that Mr. Rogers was coming to his house and everyone would think that he was a baby because Mr. Rogers went there. Well, I think that that story had a, a lot of really nice lessons and we all learned that we shouldn't worry about that, things like that. <clears throat> and then Fred said, Mark, I'd like to come to your studio and film one of my shows there. And uh, he did. And the show that he did was to help kids understand how animation worked. So we did that. There I am at my desk showing kids how I draw things and then how the animators take those drawings and make them move. And the boy in the red sweatshirt there is Michael Yarmish. He was our very first Arthur voice, our first actor. And I think we've had 12 Arthurs now over 25 years because uh, their voices start to change and we need to uh, move on to a new Arthur. And it's really not an easy task trying to find those voices that will match. And there's Fred with an Arthur doll that I gave him <clears throat> when I first visited him in Pittsburgh. And I remember the day I left, he was so happy. He, Fred loved toys and he had the Arthur doll. And when I left and said goodbye and I was walking away from his office down the hall, I heard this little voice behind me, Mark, Mark, Mark. And I turned around and Fred's door opened from his office and Arthur's head stuck out and Fred used him as a puppet and he made him move and he said, Mark, don't worry about me. I'll be just fine. And that was Fred. What's the coolest thing you ever did that I can tell you about? Okay, um, I think it would have to be meeting four presidents and going to the White House. This was a day that Barbara Bush invited me to the White House. She said we were gonna do a talk together to uh, raise money for her literacy initiative. And she said, Mark, if you come over to the White House at 7 a.m., I'll show you around. I'll give you a tour. And she had the White House historian help us. And we walked around, we looked at all the portraits of past presidents and first ladies. And then she said, would you like to go upstairs for breakfast? Well, yeah. All right. So we got in an elevator and the elevator went up to the next floor where the president lives. I never imagined I would go in there and see where the president lives. The doors open. And the first thing I saw was a beautiful little painting of Cezanne's apples. He's one of my favorite painters and he can paint apples. And the uh, apartment or the house where they lived was filled with beautiful paintings and antiques. And Laura Bush explained that she could go to any museum in Washington and just say, I would like that painting to come over to the White House, or I would like that desk. And it would come over there and they could live with it. And I thought that was really a nice thing to do for our president and his or her family. So then Laura Bush said, 
Mark, I'd like you to come to Moscow with me to represent America at the first children's book festival in Russia that Mrs. Putin was organizing. So here I am on Air Force One, and that's, I met, uh, and he became one of my good friends, R.L. Stein, who wrote the Goosebumps books. And we've now collaborated on a couple of books together. And right behind the seal there is a little apartment where the president has a bathroom. The president can take a shower on an airplane. I mean, come on. And he has a little living room in there and uh, a bedroom. It's really cool. Okay, here we are. We're all a little nervous, but we're smiling because we're getting ready to talk to a bunch of kids in Russia and only Mrs. Putin knows how to speak Russian. So we had interpreters. Uh, Laura Bush read Arthur Meets the President and Bob Stein told spooky stories. And there's Mrs. Putin when President Putin was still married and she wore for that occasion that tragic blue and yellow suit. Okay, that night, I'll never forget it. We went to the Kremlin and we had dinner with President Putin and president's wives from all over the world, different countries, and librarians from all over Russia. And that was exciting. Everyone made toasts and after every toast, you had to drink a little glass of vodka. We got kind of silly that night. Okay, here's my favorite part of being in Moscow at the airport leaving Moscow. And uh, we're saying goodbye to the American ambassador and his wife and, and they were so nice to us and showed us all over the city. But you will notice in the upper left-hand corner of this photograph is a secret service agent. He just spotted me with my camera taking this picture I didn't know I wasn't supposed to take pictures. No one told me. Well, maybe they did, but I forgot. And so right after I took this picture, the Secret Service agent charges over and he tackles me and he pulls me down on the tarmac and I'm on the ground and he's trying to take my camera away from me. And I said, wait, what if I erase the pictures? He said, you're gonna erase those pictures? I said, yeah, I'm gonna do it right now. I'm erasing those pictures. Well, he didn't know that in third grade, on the back of my report card, Miss Kingston wrote, does not follow directions. So we've got the pictures. Am I working on a new book? That's a good question. I'm always working on a new book. I can't stop working on new books. It's what I do, right? I love it. I love my job. Did I tell you that I love my job? Okay, this is a book with my buddy R.L. Stein, and it's called Honey and Funny. No, I think we changed the title to Why Does the Monster Cross the Road? And these, the, the artwork isn't finished yet, but you can probably tell that I'm working with cut paper. I paint all this paper, and I cut it out and put it together. It's a collage. You've probably heard that term. And I paint the papers like Honey's, uh, Funny's skin is all this textured paint, painted paper that I wanted him to, to have. And it's, uh, it's kind of a complicated process, but I really am enjoying it. Well, I usually get this question, will you read us a book? Yes, I will. And I thought today, since uh, one of our favorite holidays is approaching Halloween, I hope you have your costumes ready. Do you have your costumes ready? Uh, I thought maybe we should read. Oh, that's no, no one was here to help me read my question, so that doesn't work. I thought we'd read Arthur's Halloween. And this happened after I was out trick or treating with uh, Tolan and Tucker, and uh, that's where the story started. Okay, you ready? It was the night before Halloween. Arthur's family was busy making the house look spooky. It looked so spooky, in fact, that Arthur had trouble falling asleep. Things were even worse the next morning. Help! screamed Arthur when he opened his eyes. It's just me, said his sister, D.W. Boy, are you jumpy. 
don't forget, you have to take me trick-or-treating tonight. Do I really have to? Asked Arthur as he ate his cereal. Yes, you really do, said his mother. And I want to go to every house, said D.W. Arthur groaned. I'll be the only one who has to drag his baby sister along. Arthur didn't recognize anyone at school. There was a giant robot in his classroom taking attendance. Y you sound just like my teacher, Mr. Marco, said Arthur. I am your teacher, said the robot. The only one Arthur recognized was the brain. He was wrapped in aluminum foil. I'm a baked potato, said the brain. Francine passed out special morning snacks. Eat these, she said. They're bat wing brownies and vampire blood. Everyone ate them but Arthur. And then they all put on blindfolds. Buster passed around bowls he said were filled with human eyeballs and hearts and brains. Arthur turned pale. When it was his turn, he wouldn't even touch him. What a scaredy cat, said Francine. Chicken, said Muffy. They're only peeled grapes and jello and cold spaghetti. When it came time to go trick-or-treating, Buster knew which houses to skip. Don't go there, he said. They only give apples. Gross, said Francine. And don't go to the big house on the corner, said Buster. That's the witch's house. <gasps> My brother saw someone go in there last year and they never came out. Arthur tried not to look afraid. Arthur and his sister had trouble keeping up with the others. First, D.W. got her tail caught, then her bag broke. You are such a pain in the neck, said Arthur. D.W. must be short for dimwit. But D.W. didn't answer. Arthur turned around just in time to see her disappear into the witch's house. What's going to happen? Arthur's hands turned ice cold and his heart began to race. He walked up to the spooky old house. The front door was open, just a crack, and slowly he went inside. Look, cried Buster, Arthur just went into the witch's house. She'll probably put Arthur and D.W. into her oven just like Hansel and Gretel, said Sue Ellen. Maybe she's using them for weird scientific experiments, said the brain. I bet she locked him in the cellar to starve, said Buster. Maybe we should follow him, said Francine. Maybe we should call the police, said Muffy. But everyone was too scared to move. Inside the house, it was very cold. Arthur thought he saw ghosts all around him. He walked down a long, dark hall. At the end, he saw a light under a door. He heard voices. One was his sister's. Oh, there you are, said the witch. We were waiting for you. I came to get my sister. We have to go. I hear my mother calling us, said Arthur. I don't hear anything, said D.W. My name is Mrs. Tibble. I hope you won't leave without some cider and donuts first. They're chocolate, your favorite, said D.W. Look at all her cats. I've waited all night for trick-or-treaters, but you're the only ones, said Mrs. Tibble. Years ago, our doorbell never stopped ringing. Maybe it's broken like your windows, said D.W. Mrs. Tibble nodded. It is harder for me to keep up with this big place these days. Well, maybe if we help you fix up your yard, the place won't look so spooky, said Arthur. Arthur finished his donut as Mrs. Tibble opened the door and turned on the porch light. She gave Arthur and D.W. a big hug. See you Saturday to rake leaves, said Arthur. You're still alive, said Francine. 
I can't believe you went in there alone, said the brain. You're so brave, said Sue Ellen. What's in the bag, asked Buster. Probably eyeballs, hearts, and brains, said Francine. Well, it's easy to find out, said Arthur. Just close your eyes and reach in, unless you're too scared. We've been to every house now. Can we take the shortcut home through the cemetery, asked D.W. The cemetery? On Halloween? Are you guys crazy? asked Francine. Ah, follow me, said Arthur as he marched ahead. The cemetery is a great place. People are just dying to get in. Get it? Uh, Tolan gave me that joke. He wanted to be a stand-up comedian at that age. <laughs> and I just want to say one more thing. It's like a commercial. I wouldn't be here today doing this fun stuff if it wasn't for a great teacher. My art teacher, Nancy Bryan, who was my art teacher in junior high and high school, and she helped me get a scholarship to go to art school. And uh, without great teachers, you know, I think there are a lot of kids that wouldn't be doing things that they do when they grow up. Uh, Fred Rogers told me one day, everyone needs just one person to believe in them, every child, to make it in the world. And I think he was right. And for many kids, it's a teacher in their life who, who does that for them. So uh, to me, teachers are, are my heroes and I celebrate them and honor them whenever I get a chance. And I hope you do too. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have some good questions for me. Okay, let's that was... figure out how to do our questions. <laughs> Kevin will help us. Yeah, he so, <laughs> thank you so much, Mark. And um, Mark, if you want to stop the presentation, just hit stop share at the top of the screen. Okay, I and can then, do that. I and think. then you'll be on the big screen again when you speak. There we go, perfect. Thank you so very much, Mark. That was lovely. And I do hope that we have some, some questions from the audience at this point. So what I would like to ask is, uh, if you do have questions, you can type them in the chat. And also, um, please keep your microphones off. But if you do want to turn your cameras on, if, any, if, if you want Mark to see you and your, your family in your living room, you can go ahead and turn your cameras on now too. And um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit loudly. I'm going to kind of uh, break the illusion right now because Mark and I are actually in the same room, even though it doesn't look like it. I'll turn my computer. Can you say hi, Mark? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Here like, I am on stage. <laughs> <laughs> no dancing bears today. I'm sorry. <laughs> so our first question that has already come into the chat is, what will your next Arthur story be about? Uh, my next Arthur story is my last Arthur story. It's called Believe in Yourself, and it's a different kind of Arthur book because I wrote it for both adults who grew up with Arthur when they were kids, and now they're parents. And so it's a really special book for me, and I got to talk a lot about where all this came from and what Arthur taught me over all these years. Don has a question about a specific book. Is the book Arthur's Teacher Moves In based on real life? Arthur's teacher trouble? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. It was like being in Mr. Ratburn's class. He made us sit in alphabetical order. We weren't allowed to even pick up our pencils until he gave us permission. And kids fainted in his class. I'm not kidding you, because I got to carry one of the bodies to the nurse's office to be revived. And if you carried the bodies to the nurse's office, Everyone wanted to know what was going on in Mr. Ratburn's class and why were you carrying bodies down the hall? You were kind of like a celebrity. Next question. Zoe would like to know where you were born. What? Where, where was I born? Mm -hmm. Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's right on the lake. And that's where I was born. And I was interested in seeing other parts of the world. And so I got to go to Cleveland to go to school, which I really liked. Our art school was right across the street from the art museum, and that was really good. Um, and uh, then I moved to Boston, and now I live in New York City and Martha's Vineyard. Pretty Desert good places. 
Desiree would like to know, what is your favorite Arthur book? Oh, I think Arthur's Teacher Trouble. You know, it's, I like reading that. And I love the ending where D.W. Uh, finds out that she is going to have Mr. Radford for a teacher next year in kindergarten. And I'm working on um, an Arthur feature film. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I really like the story. And uh, I think it could be interesting for kids because it deals with social media and all the things that kids have to deal with with social media. So I've got my fingers crossed. <laughs> we have two people asking the same question, so I better ask this one. Henry and Jessica want to know if you can choose who is your favorite Arthur character? D.W. I, <laughs> absolutely D.W. because she has all the funny lines. I love writing for her and getting in her head. Uh, and you know, she's a lot like I told you my three sisters growing up, they were, they're hysterical. Whenever we get together, we laugh so much. Uh, when we would visit my mother, all the four of us uh, would make my mother laugh so hard. My mother would say, I'm gonna wet my pants. You're making me laugh so hard. <laughs> Another favorite question, Don wants to know, do you have a favorite PBS episode of Arthur? You know, one that pops up in my head, do you remember that episode, D.W. the copycat, where she dresses like Arthur and she does everything that Arthur does and she's driving him crazy? I don't know, that comes up. I liked, I, I thought it was really cool. We got to do Mr. Ratburn getting married. Um, and let's see, what a, I liked uh, Buster explaining how asthma works and we got to go inside his lungs. Um, and we did a lot, you know, and Arthur's um, grandpa, Dave, had Alzheimer's and, you know, that was in our family. We had to deal with that. And, you know, I, th I think it helped Arthur a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the, my most fun jobs with the TV show is turning our guest stars into animals. Like, I mean, Matt Damon didn't know what hit him when I turned him into a bear. <laughs> okay. What do you think makes Arthur and his friends so timeless for kids of all ages? Wow. I, you know, I think kids see Arthur and his friends as real. Uh, I know that because I get letters. One asked me the other day, could you send me Francine's phone number? And so I knew I was doing a good job. And, you know, maybe because they're based on kids I knew when I was Arthur's age, that helps to make them feel real. Um, and, you know, I, I, Arthur has not been canceled, by the way. I don't know. that. Like a few weeks ago, we had that horrible rumor going around. And uh, it's, he's going to be on PBS for many years. And the reason that that's possible is because the stories about Arthur and his friends deal with things that you guys are dealing with all the time. And they're not going to go away. I think you touched on this during the presentation, but Anne would like to know, how was DW created? Um, how was she created? You mean drawn? Um, it says, how is DW made? So I think she's wondering how, like, what? Well, first of all, I, I thought of my sisters as the inspiration for someone who had sassy comments about everything that happened that were funny. Um, and then, uh, you know, I just... She, when I drew her, I started with a little aardvark. So I needed the head to be the same as Arthur. And then I thought I'd give her hair like my sisters when they were young. And I put her in that pink jumper and shoes. And she kind of wears mostly the same thing all the time, as does Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> Carter would like to know, um, is there anything that you can say about wanting to become a children's author and illustrator? Any tips you can provide? Oh, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think the best thing that you could do is keep a sketchbook or a, a, a pad of paper every day, write something down that happens to you during the day that you thought about or you, you know, really wanted to uh, think about a little bit. Because when you are an author, that's where I think a lot of things happen and, and start for us. But then you could make it funny. 
you can make it sad, you can make it scary. Um, and if you are interested in drawing, pick out something every day to draw. I once had an art teacher who said, if you think something is ugly, try drawing it. And that is surprisingly helpful. You get to see, because there's beauty in everything around us and good in every person around us. Related to drawing, what materials do you use when you're making your artwork? I use Sharpie pens to do the outlines for Arthur. And then I use watercolor and the Sharpie pens have permanent ink in them. That way the line doesn't get all blurry. And then when the watercolor dries, I add details with colored pencils. Easy peasy. <laughs> Actually, and before the next question, that gives me a chance to do a quick plug. If you come to our museum before the end of the year and see the exhibit, you'll actually get to see Mark Brown's original artworks, his illustrations for Arthur and many of the other books. So you'll get to see in person just how he created his illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica wants to know, what is the most fulfilling part about being a children's author? Um, meeting kids who read your books and hearing that they like the stories or how that story maybe changed something in their family uh, or it reminds them of something, uh, the characters remind them of people in their lives. And it's, it's always fun to, to hear those connections, how they, Arthur goes into real families. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna have a little sip of water. I'm not used to talking so much. <laughs> it's a very lonely life. I go to my studio and, you know, I don't talk to people all day. I'm just in there working, making those stories and drawing. And next question. I need to jump back because unfortunately I missed Owen and Susan's question, which is a really good one. Oh. What, what books, shows, or movies did you like when you were a kid? Mm, good one. The first book I can remember was a little golden book about going to the circus. And it, it, it just, I, I can still see the pictures so clearly in my mind and the skies were so beautiful. They were yellow and pink and blue. And, um, and this little boy had a great time at the circus with his dad and, his, and then he fell asleep going home and he's on his dad's shoulders. And I don't know, that just made me, feel good to read that story. I remember um, every Thanksgiving, Grandma Thora would take us on the train from Erie to Cleveland to go Christmas shopping. And uh, one time she gave me a book to read on the train, Tom Sawyer. And I love that story about Tom Sawyer. Um, those were the, the two things that come to mind right away. But, you know, then I became a, an adult and I started reading all these picture books that I didn't read when I was a kid. And I found authors that I love and I look forward to their new books all the time. We have just a, a couple more questions here. Courtney wants to know how many total Arthur books are there now? Uh, I, I didn't think you were going to ask me that, Courtney, because uh, I don't have them counted up yet. But um, over 125. I like my, what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and Amy wants to know, at what age did you start writing? Um, I wrote the first Arthur book when I was 29. I was right out of art school and I was teaching in this college and I needed a new job, but I didn't know that would be it. <laughs> Had you been writing stories before that? Not, not Arthur, but just stories in I general? I did. Oh, yeah. I, I wrote terrible stories before that. Um, but I liked writing them, and I would write a lot of mysteries like The Diamond Dagger or The Daisies Didn't Die. Yeah, and then I would illustrate the cover. Uh, yeah, I was always writing, and in fact, I used to um, doodle a lot and write when I was supposed to be doing my math in fourth grade and third grade and I would get into trouble. And now it's my job. <laughs> and, Go figure. I, and I have a question that I'd like to know the answer to. You 
you write and you illustrate yourself all of the Arthur books. Yeah. So I'm curious, how long from start to finish, from idea to mm. sketching to writing the story to getting it published, what, how mm. long of a span a is question. that for each book? Yeah, they don't just pop out. Um, I, you know, now after writing about these characters for so many years, I do know them a little better. Um, and so it's a little bit faster, but I'd say if I had to uh, push it all together in a time frame, it would be like maybe three months to four months for writing the story and doing the pictures. And uh, I'll do like 30 versions of the story before I show it to my publisher. And then my editor is the person, like a teacher, who reads the story and says, you know, Mark, you could fix this and it would make the story a little better. And so I fix it and send it back. And then we get the story right. And then I start the pictures. That's the fun part for me. And I think we'll end this presentation today with this question, which is my personal favorite question. And I think the most important question that we're gonna be asking you all morning. Jamie and Nick would like to know, what is your favorite dinosaur? Um, oh, probably a T-Rex. I love drawing dinosaurs and I love drawing monsters. <coughs> Well, the correct answer is Stegosaurus, but we'll accept T-Rex. <laughs> oh, come on. Loosen up out there. T-Rex is fun. Mark, I want to thank you so very much for, for joining us this morning. I hope everybody out there enjoyed it. And um, for anybody who is in the Cooperstown area, um, Mark is here at the museum, and he will be here for a brief while to um, sign some books and say hi to people up in the gallery till about 1230. So if you are in the area, please feel free and stop by. Um, we did record this session, so there will be some opportunities later through the year to, uh, to watch it again, and I'll be posting about that later on. Um, but let's give um, Mark a hand, everybody. Thank you so much, Thank Mark, you for, for doing Thank you for being good this. listeners, everybody. Thank you for reading my books, watching my show. You're the best. I love you. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.